Welcome to Whiskey Cast, cask strength conversation featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 893 for August 30th, 2021. Coming up in a few minutes. I think we've always tried to do our best of approaching everything as that miracle hybrid between art and commerce. Because uh, it is both. If you don't have the art, commerce doesn't matter. And if you don't have the commerce, you really can't pursue your art. Ten years ago, Paul Letko opened Few Spirits in the Chicago suburb of Evanston, Illinois. Just one of the many craft distilleries that opened during those early boom days of the craft distilling movement. While not all of those distilleries have made it, Few Spirits has thrived and will release its 10th anniversary whiskey this week in Illinois, along with its first bottled in bond release this October. I'll talk with Paul Hutko about the early days and the future of Few Spirits, along with that balance between commerce and art. That's just ahead, along with the What I'm Tasting This Week department, your voice behind the label, and... To have your peer uh, award you with an honor like that is uh, is pretty awesome. The news is next on this week's Whiskey Cast. What do Japan and Scotland have in common? You guessed it, whiskey. That's why Doers brought these two cultures together in our newest cast series innovation, introducing Doers Eight Year Japanese Smooth. We took the doers you know and love and finished it in rare Mizanar oak casks for a complex and balanced scotch whiskey like no other. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. Ever wondered where Redbreast got its name? Well, let's go back to 1912 and be glad our bird-watching founder didn't spot the bar-tailed godwit that day. Proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast, Redbreast. Pass it on. Let's get started with the news. The COVID-19 pandemic and the Delta variant are causing people to rethink their travel plans, and that includes whiskey travel. A number of brands have decided to pull their brand ambassadors back off the road after gradually starting to send them out this summer. And the New York Times reports European Union officials will recommend today that their member nations reimpose travel restrictions on U.S. visitors. That decision is up to individual countries, but the U.S. is well above the threshold for new cases and hospitalizations needed to be on the EU's safe travel list. Of course, the EU's decision does not apply to Scotland or the rest of Great Britain, The U.S. remains on Great Britain's Amber List, with testing required for all travelers and a 10-day quarantine required for unvaccinated travelers. The U.S. continues to keep its borders closed for most non-essential travel from Europe and Canada. And we have had one more whiskey event affected by the pandemic. Stockholm Beer and Whiskey Festival organizers have now decided to compress this year's event from two weekends into one and move it back a week to the second weekend of October. Meanwhile, Beam Suntory's Lafroig Distillery is gradually opening to visitors for the first time since the pandemic forced Isla's distilleries to shut their doors to guests last year. The distillery will offer limited tours and tastings with advance bookings only. And while Beam Suntory's Beaumore Distillery on Isla is still not ready to offer tours just yet, the distillery gift shop is open. In other news, the owner of Kentucky's Preservation Distillery in Bardstown is the latest defendant in the Operation Varsity Blues case, to reach a plea agreement with federal prosecutors. Marcy Palatella was scheduled to go on trial next month in Boston on charges stemming from her indictment two years ago for paying $500,000 to get her son into the University of Southern California as a, quote, football recruit, with some of that money being used to bribe a university official. 
Prosecutors told Reuters that Palatella has now agreed to plead guilty to a single charge of conspiring to commit honest services mail fraud. The agreement calls for her to spend six weeks in prison, six months of home confinement, pay a $250,000 fine, and perform 500 hours of community service. Kentucky state law bans convicted felons from holding liquor licenses, but the state's Alcohol Beverage Control Commissioner has not responded to our questions about whether Palatella's conviction could affect preservation distilleries' licenses in that state. Palatella and her husband also own a liquor distributor in California. State regulators there have been waiting for a resolution in this case before considering any action against that company's state licenses. Duncan Taylor and Company is investing in its hometown of Huntley in the Aberdeenshire region of Scotland. The independent bottler and blending company led by Moji and Ewan Shand has purchased the Bank Restaurant in Huntley and will complete our renovation project before reopening next month. That follows the company's purchase of the Castle Hotel in Huntley earlier this year. The hotel is also undergoing a renovation and will reopen early next year. Duncan Taylor already has its blending and bottling facility in Huntley, along with its Whiskies of Scotland retail shop. It's awards season, and both the American Craft Spirits Association and the American Distilling Institute announced the results of their annual competitions this week. The ACSA named Milam and Green's Port Finished Rye as not only the best whiskey in this year's competition, but the overall best-in-show winner. I talked with Milam and Green master distiller Marlene Holmes shortly after she got back from Louisville this weekend and the Bourbon Women's Annual Symposium. We are all so happy about it. I mean, it's a tremendous honor uh, to be best in show with one of your labels. Actually, that Port Rye was a gold and uh, I think best in whiskey and best in show. So it kind of it kind of uh, swept the boards there. But our our whole team is just ecstatic about uh, the news there for that. You know, to have your peers uh, award you with an honor like that is uh, is pretty awesome. It is. And that was one of your first releases a couple of years ago, right? Yeah, it was. You know, actually, Mark, that label started out uh, kind of as an experiment for us. We got four pork barrels in, and, uh, you know, we thought, well, let's let's see what we can do with it. And uh, pretty quick, uh, you know, the Texas heat down here moves things along pretty quick. And uh, in in about five or six weeks, uh, you know, we check it pretty often. And that rye had come along really nicely in those port barrels. And we was ready to dump it at, at about six weeks. And uh, and it just has been off and running with it. it. It has, you know, been a really nice product for us. It won a double gold last year for us. How do you top it next year? Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that that's a good one there. Uh, well, we we just going to keep on, you know, doing what we've been doing, Mark. You know, the we've got a really good group of folks, the whole team. Uh, and when I talk about the team, not just you know the group there at the distillery, but but everybody on on board with us from Island and Green. Uh, you know, it's all about making a, a really good product. It's what's in the bottle, and uh, so we're just going to keep doing. Uh, you know, stay the course and keep uh, doing what we've been doing. We've got a couple of uh, releases coming up. Uh, got our second batch of grain to glass that'll come out here uh, later next month. And then we've got another uh, Castle Hill uh, that we're working on and I uh, hope to have it out sometime next spring. So, uh, you know, who knows? The sky's the limit. While the ACSA awards were announced online, the American Distilling Institute handed out its annual awards at this week's ADI conference in Louisville. Pennington Distilling's Davidson Reserve Four Grain Tennessee Bourbon was named Best Craft Distilled Whiskey, while Sweden's Spirit of Haven Mercurius Corn Whiskey was named the Best International Whiskey. 
Uncle Nearest, 1856, was named Best Whiskey in the separate competition for Merchant Bottled or Blended Spirits. The McAllen has unveiled its latest luxury limited edition series with Volume 1 of the Tales of the McAllen series. It's a 71-year-old single malt distilled in 1950 and honors Captain John Grant, who turned his family's land along the River Spey into the Easter Elkies estate long before the distillery itself was built in 1824. Only 350 Lalique decanters will be available. The price tag, 60,000 pounds each. Aberfeldy is out with the third edition in its French red wine casks collection. This one is an 18-year-old single malt finished in Cote Roti wine casks from the Rhone Valley and is a follow-up to last year's 18-year-old finished in Pauillac casks from Bordeaux. It'll be on sale starting this week at Aberfeldy's online shop and will be available soon in the U.S., Taiwan, China, Germany, and France, along with other countries in Europe and Asia. The U.S. recommended retail price is around $120 a bottle. Ardbeg is releasing the third batch of its 19-year-old Trayvon single malt. It's matured in a combination of American oak and Oloroso sherry casks, with a slightly different blend from the two previous batches. It'll be available at retailers starting this week. Ardbeg is also releasing a new Monsters of Smoke trio pack, with three 200-milliliter bottles of the Ardbeg 10-year-old, an Oa, and the 5-year-old Wee Beastie. In the U.S., Lux Road Distillers is releasing a trio of its own, the second edition of the Blood Oath Trilogy, created by head distiller and blender John Rempe. Packs number 4, 5, and 6 were released between 2018 and last year, and these three bottle packs were held back from the original releases. Only 1,400 sets will be available at a recommended retail price of $799 each. Brooklyn's Widow Jane Distillery is taking its Lucky 13 bourbon from the private single barrel program to the distillery's main portfolio. Head distiller Lisa Wicker is now blending small groups of barrels for the Lucky 13 expression, it'll be available in limited quantities with a recommended retail price of $99.99 each. And finally, this is a sad story. Two-year-old Wyatt Purdue lives in Carmel, Indiana and suffers from cystic fibrosis. Thanks to experimental treatments, he is doing well, but his long-term prognosis is still pretty bleak. Wyatt's dad, Nathan, is a whiskey lover and collector, and he has decided to use some of his whiskey collection to help fund cystic fibrosis research. Now, it's illegal to raffle off whiskeys in both Indiana and Kentucky unless you're working with a charity that happens to have the right liquor license. And the Kentucky Derby Museum in Louisville has that license. So they worked out a deal where both the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation and the museum will benefit. They're raffling off five bottles of Van Winkle whiskeys from 2011 through 2020, along with a hotel stay in Louisville and a VIP experience for four at the Kentucky Derby Museum. Tickets are $100 each and on sale online through September 23rd, We've posted a link in the show notes for this episode at whiskeycast.com. Of course, that's where you can keep up on the latest whiskey news all week long. If you missed Friday night's Happy Hour Live webcast with Scotch Whiskey veterans Steve Beal, David Blackmore, and Ewan Morgan, along with Stranahan's head distiller Owen Martin, the on-demand replay is available right now at the WhiskeyCast YouTube channel, and the podcast version drops later this week. This Friday night, my guests will be Four Roses Master Distiller Brent Elliott, Daryl McNally of Limevady Irish Whiskey, 
He's the former master distiller at Dublin Liberties Distillery and Whiskey Magazine editor Christopher Coates. The fun starts at 5 p.m. New York time on our YouTube channel, the Whiskey Cast Facebook page, Twitter, and Twitch. Time now for the Whiskey Cast Calendar of Events. Castle and Key Distillery in Frankfort, Kentucky, has its monthly Springhouse Music Series Night this Wednesday, September 1st. Catoctin Creek's monthly bottling workshop is set for this Saturday in Purcellville, Virginia. The Bay Area Houston Whiskey and Wine Fest is Sunday in Alvin, Texas. Distillery 291 in Colorado Springs, Colorado, has its 10th anniversary celebration planned for the weekend of September 10th through the 12th. McTeers has its next auction of rare whiskeys in Glasgow, Scotland on the 10th. That's also the date for the American Whiskey Convention in Philadelphia, the Whiskey X in Brooklyn, New York, and George Washington's Whiskey Rebellion Fest at the Allegheny Museum in Cumberland, Maryland. The Midlands Whiskey Festival is on the 11th in Birmingham, England, and the San Diego Spirits Festival is that weekend in San Diego, California. Right now, we have 158 in-person and virtual events on the searchable calendar at whiskeycast.com. If you are planning on attending an in-person event, please check ahead for any COVID-related requirements for vaccinations or masks. And remember that in many places, event organizers are allowed to impose restrictions even stronger than those ordered by local health officials. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. Small batch. How would you describe it? It's like an Irishman's understanding of baseball. Extremely limited. Proud sponsor of WhiskeyCast. Redbreast. Pass it on. Whiskey Cast in Depth is brought to you by Oban and the Classic Malts lineup. The years between 2010 and 2012 saw some of the biggest expansion in the American distilling industry since the end of Prohibition, as craft distilling went from a fad to a full scale movement. While not all of the distilleries that opened back then have survived, we are seeing a lot of 10th anniversary celebrations and whiskey releases from those that did. And that includes Few Spirits in Evanston, Illinois. Founder Paul Hletko has played a key role in the growth of the craft distilling movement. He was one of the founders of the American Craft Spirits Association in 2013, when a group of distillers decided to break away from the American Distilling Institute and formed their own non-profit group. He also served as the ACSA's president during 2016 and 2017. This week, he'll be releasing Fuse 10th Anniversary 4-Grain Bourbon at select retailers in Illinois, and I caught up with him on a Zoom call the other day. With Fuse Spirits celebrating the 10th anniversary this year, bring us back to that first year and what you have learned since then before we start talking about new whiskeys and what you've been doing tell me what you learned over the last 10 years and would you do it all over again oh man i don't know i mean it's really been a heck of a ride of 10 years and it's something we're real happy and really proud of that we're a small grain to glass craft distillery doing everything ourselves uh and we've been able to survive 10 years in a pretty amazing business full of amazing you know, amazing liquid out there. And so, you know, we're really proud. Um, and the growth has just been really it's kind of dominating and overwhelming. You know, I was just talking yesterday about, I remember when it used to take me two full weeks of work to fill a single barrel. Uh, it doesn't take us two weeks anymore, but uh, it's really, you know, it's really cool to kind of look back and see the power of what our team can do when we're all working together I am chasing this crazy dream we have of making the world's best whiskey. You didn't answer the question. Would you do it all over again? <laughs> would I do it all over again? You know, the thing is, I actually would. Uh, a few spirits has been the hardest thing I've ever done, uh, other than raise my kids. 
Uh, it's been the most rewarding thing I've ever done other than raise my kids. Um, and it just means a lot to me personally and professionally to be able to chase this dream. Um, you know, would I do it all over again? Yeah. Uh, would I change things if I could look, go back and change you know, a little bit here and change a little bit there? Yeah, but realistically, I think we've done pretty well. You know, we've got an amazing team, and uh, I'm just really honored that I get to go to work every day with these people. Uh, it's just, it's an amazing family we have, an amazing group of people, talented, smart, funny, kind, uh, everything you really want. And they're, <laughs> these people are some of the best in the world at their jobs. What did you do differently at Few that uh, other distillers who started out a decade ago and didn't make it? Did. What did you do differently that helped you succeed? I think we've done a lot of things differently, but uh, certainly one of the big things has always been we outwork an awful lot of people. Uh, we're some of the hardest working people out there in a business full of hard working people. Um, I think we uh, have made some of the better liquid that's out there. I think their quality has always been unassailable. And I think that that badge of few spirits on the bottle has always been an indicator of quality. Um, of course, we continue to just get better and better every day, but I think it's always been a good indicator of quality. And uh, I think we've always tried to do our best of approaching everything as that miracle hybrid between art and commerce, because uh, it is both. If you don't have the art, the commerce doesn't matter. And if you don't have the commerce, you really can't pursue your art. And so it is both. It is a business. Uh, it is an art. And, you know, especially for me personally, few has always been that business. It's always been that art. But for me personally, it's always also been that family and that blood and, you know, bringing back to my great grandparents and my grandparents. And then, you know, even looking at my children and trying to trying to demonstrate for them, uh, chase your dreams and live what you can and do your best in life and, you know, give something your all. How important was the uh, deal that you did with Samson and Surrey a few years ago to uh, bring in some capital and some uh, additional help into the business? I think working with Samson and Surrey has just been one of the highlights, frankly. Um, it's a joy to be able to work with professionals of that level that can really allow me to focus in on what I want to do better. Um, I'm not a good sales manager. I'm not a good uh, corporate executive. I'm not a good a lot of things. What I am is really good at making whiskey. And so working with professionals like we have at Samson Surrey allow me to focus on what I want to focus on and what I'm passionate about. And it lets them really do a lot of that. Uh, obviously, I'm also in the whiskey business, which is uh, incredibly capital intensive. Uh, if you're not aware of that, you probably should be. Uh, and so Working with Samson Surrey has allowed us to bring an awful lot of capital to really help us continue to grow and build the company and the brand. But at the core, it's really about the people and working together to share a dream. Yes, the business is building, but what it really does is allow us to really do our best personally and professionally, including you know, doing things like making it to 10 years. Uh, certainly the last, uh, shall we say, 18 months or so would have been materially more challenging if we were alone. But being able to work with a team like we have at Samson and Surrey, uh, it's, you know, it's made a huge difference. Uh, I really, <laughs> I'm really honored to be able to work with my partners at Samson and Surrey every day. Are you a better distiller now than you were 10 years ago? What uh, have you learned now that you didn't know then when you started making whiskey? I mean, honestly, if anybody that could answer that question and say, no, I'm not better now than I was 10 years ago and needs to get the hell out of the business. Um, so, yes, I do believe I'm a better distiller today than I was 10 years ago. Um, I mean, <laughs> I dare you, the longer you're in the business, the more you're going to say the answer. Yes. You know, it may well be somebody who's new has got a little bit more of a big head. Oh, no, I know what I'm doing. I know everything. No, I mean, the longer you're in the business, the more you don't know. Um and that's certainly true for me. The longer I'm here, the less I know. But am I getting better every day? Absolutely. We need to talk about the music connection. 
and your roots in music because uh, you have had the unique opportunity to partner with some really cool bands over the years on a few whiskeys. And yep. I know that goes back to your days in music. Uh, tell us about that and about what it's like when you collaborate with musicians and other artists on these projects. I think it's a really unique joy that I get to have. And just like you kind of hinted at, you know, I'm a former pro guitar player. Music has been an incredibly important part of my life. And one of the biggest frustrations of my life is that I'm not a particularly good guitar player. Um, I don't have, I'm not particularly talented. I can work hard at it and I can cover up a lot of my own inherent flaws, but I'm never going to be a world-class musician. And that sucks, but that's how it is. Um, and so, but being able to work with musicians like Alice in Chains and work with musicians like the Flaming Lips, and uh, you don't even know about our one that's coming out probably next spring that we're working on and hasn't been released yet. Um, and you're not going to tell me about. Well, I guess there's not really a secret, but uh, I'm not trying to drop stuff on you live either. But oh, uh, go ahead. Well, that's what well, I live for. Go ahead. <laughs> no, so we work with a band called the Black Rebel Motorcycle Club. I've been a fan of theirs for. 20 years probably uh, which is interesting because they've been around for about 20 years and you know working with these passionate and creative musicians is great because you get to kind of approach your own craft from an outsider's perspective so working with a musician that you know yeah they enjoy drinking whiskey but they don't know anything about making whiskey and so they can kind of approach the prospect or the process of making the whiskey from uh, you know, an outsider's view, which means that they don't know any of the rules that they're breaking and they don't know what, you know, they don't know what they're doing. And that's amazing because they're not biased or poisoned by, you know, 20 years of or 10 years of, oh, that'll never work. You kind of come at it with a enthusiasm that gets beat out of you when you're in this business. Um and so it's really, really nice. And I think it's cool that here at Few Spirits, we've always tried to take very much a musician's approach to making our whiskey. Uh, you know, I'm personally a raging deadhead and a huge fan of improvisational music. And we try to bring some of that improvisational attitude towards making whiskey. It uh, doesn't really work that great because it's not really making whiskey in real time. But it, we do bring that lack of fear of failure to it. You know, if we'll do something and if it doesn't work, we'll just move on. No, that doesn't mean we're going to release it and get behind it and stand behind products that aren't, that aren't working, but we're not afraid to make something that isn't good. Uh, we're just afraid to sell it. Um, you're wearing, and people on the podcast can't see this, but you're wearing a uh, golf shirt with a Grateful Dead inspired, uh, the, the dancing bear. I, I, I am indeed. I, I am a, uh, like I said, I am a raging deadhead. Uh, but uh, it's it's that approach and it's that creativity that brings. And so, you know, working with the Flaming Lips, I think we even talked about this a couple of years ago. You know, I wanted to make a psychedelic whiskey without dropping small squares of paper into the bottle. And so how do you do that? You know, what is a psychedelic whiskey? Working with Alice in Chains, you know, what is a really heavy, grungy, aggressive whiskey like how do you bring that into the whiskey world how do you translate music into whiskey and whiskey into music we can all agree that whiskey and music are great pairings but how do you bring them together in a way that is true to the whiskey and true to the music and we don't want to just slap a label on it and say hey this is sponsored by you know this whiskey is brought to you by coca-cola this whiskey is brought to you by this it's we want it to be a product that has integrity to few. We want it to be a product that has integrity to the band. We want it to be a product that has integrity to the music. And we want it to make sense. It's everybody's a part of it and everybody's collaborating. And you know, like working with Black Girl Motorcycle Club was pretty intense. Uh, we were developing the whiskey during, you know, pretty much, uh, what I would call the peak of COVID, and I'm not trying to get into this or that, but uh, it was, you know, summer of 2020 when I think it was, you know, lockdown was at some of its most fierce. And, you know, we were trying to communicate to doing all the tastings via Zoom. Rob was, uh, Rob was in Europe, and so we were trying to FedEx samples over to Europe to get him samples of this. And his managers were in 
LA and we're, you know, other band members are in Vegas. And so you were, tr- we're flying all these samples all over the world and every round of, you know, every round of you know, drafts could take a month. So it was just, you know, it was an intense work prospect. Uh, but I think it's going to pay off in that bottle. You talked about trying to make a psychedelic whiskey. We are seeing, uh, with the uh, liberalization of certain laws in certain states, we're starting to see more of these uh, CBD and hemp infused drinks that are non-alcoholic. And the, I keep getting asked this occasionally when we're going to start seeing some of this stuff working its way into the whiskey space. And personally, I hope we never do because I don't really want to cross intoxicants here. Sure. But uh, yeah. what's your take on that? I think it's obviously it's coming. Um, I don't have a, I don't have a feeling that I don't want it to happen. I have no problem with mixing intoxicants. Um, it's a difficult question commercially because I think that there's an awful lot of artistry that you can do by combining them. Uh, obviously, if you go to, yeah, you know, certainly I'm not part of this and I would never do that. But uh, if you go to many distiller festivals, there's an awful lot of Green Dragon being passed around. Uh, again, never me, of course, but uh, you know, it has been done. Um, now, wait a second. I have not seen this, and it's been a while since I've been to a whiskey festival because of COVID. So you're going to have to define what Green Dragon is. Uh, I, I just heard rumors about it, so I don't really know for sure. But uh, there are those who say Green Dragon would be a hybrid between cannabis and uh, spirit. Interesting. A CBD type vodka or something like that? Uh, yeah, but not necessarily CBD. Okay. We'll, uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll leave it at that because uh, but I would such never a project would be incredibly illegal under current U.S. law. Yes. Uh, so it's certainly something I would never do. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, it is coming and there is THC beer, there is THC cider, there is THC beverage out there. As far as crossing them, I think it's an interesting one because I think that the business is going to want to cross intoxicants, but it's unclear to me that the general public wants the intoxicants crossed. Uh, do people want THC in their whiskey? Uh, I honestly don't know. Um, I know the business wants to cross the THC in the whiskey. I can guarantee you that. Uh, but do people want it? I, I don't know. Let's talk about the whiskeys that you're releasing around your 10th anniversary. Let's start with the the one that's for Illinois, the actual official 10th anniversary. Uh, we're just real excited. It's certainly, uh, it's a great whiskey. It's a four grain bourbon uh, that we're releasing. I believe it's going to launch this coming week. Uh, it's our 10th anniversary, four grain bourbon. Uh, so wheat and rye, it's the first four grain bourbon we've ever done. And it's a really interesting whiskey because it's very, very weird. And what I mean by that is that we put it in different barrels than we usually use. And it got shipped to Kentucky for about three years. And so the barrels aged in Kentucky for two to three years. I don't remember exactly how long. Uh, And then they came back to us where it's been aging for a little bit longer. And so it is a very different whiskey than we have released before because it's a different mash bill inside different oak. And it's got that really weird uh, aging regimen of probably about half of the aging in Kentucky and half of the aging up here. And it'll be available, you say, this coming week? Uh, It'll be available this coming week, I believe, at Binnie's, as well as fine retailers across the great state of Illinois. Which, of course, is your home state, Uh Why don't the rest of us get it? Or is that just because you want to do something for your local uh, community? Uh, We're trying to keep a little bit of it home. Also, there's not that much of it. It is a limited offer. It's not, there's not a whole lot. And we think there's going to be a lot of excitement here in our home state. You know, there are not a lot of craft distilleries that have made it 10 years. Um, And out of those craft distilleries that have made it 10 years, uh, almost none of them are grain to glass. You know, folks that are doing it the way we do it, making our whiskey from scratch, there aren't very many of us that have been around for 10 years. And so I think an awful lot of people across Illinois are pretty proud uh, that we can be home to, you know, at, you know to one of them. We also think we were home to two of them with Koval. But uh, I think that's really interesting and really cool that we at Illinois are some of the most established craft distilling and some of the best, quite frankly. You use the term grain to glass a little differently than I think others would use it uh, 
I want to get your take on this because others would say grain to glass means you're actually growing your own grain on your own farm and then distilling it. And I know there's not a lot of farmland around Evanston, Illinois, so I'm just curious how you uh, define grain to glass in that category. So grain to glass means that we, yes, we do not farm our own. We never have, never will. We are in an urban area, but we bring in grain and turn, turn it into whiskey. We don't use spreadsheets to purchase from MGP. Uh, the term that I would t- call people that grow their own and then turn it in would be seed the spirit. Um, That's so a good way of putting it. I just, so to me, I, it's, this business is so full of different words that mean different things to different people. Uh, so, so to me, if you're growing your own grain and turning it into spirit, Uh, To me, that's seed to spirit, not grain to glass. One of those terms that I think we all agree on is bottled in bond. And you've not done one of those until now, have you? We've never done a bottled in bond product before. And our whiskey has certainly been some of the oldest craft whiskey out in the marketplace for some time. Uh, Our whiskey has been straight whiskey for many, many years. Our whiskey has been relatively old. Uh, I've just... I don't personally like age statements. I don't think they are solid. And so we have shied away from doing anything that says bottled and bond because it's a backdoor age statement. Um, and that was teeing it up so that you could talk about your new bottled and bond, Paul. That was uh, that was a setup there. OK, <laughs> but we are really excited that we're releasing a bottled and bond product nationally. Well, at least in six markets uh, starting October 1st. Uh, and so this is one of the first places you're going to be hearing about it. Um, but we got a bottle of the bomb bourbon and we're real excited. Uh, not a whole lot of distilleries offer bottle of the bond products, uh, ranging from the legacy distillers all the way down to craft distillers. Obviously there are other products out there that'll bottle and bond. I'm not trying to pretend that we're the only ones, uh, but it is exciting that we are releasing a bottle of the bond product. Uh, there's again, people listening to this podcast are going to know what that means. They're going to understand it. They're going to appreciate it. And uh, hopefully they're going to be looking for it. And that sort of uh, imprimatur that the term bottled in bond has on a bottle gives you a little bit of an advantage when it comes to being on a shelf, especially if uh, somebody is looking at a few spirits bottle for the first time, right? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of people that, you know, I think sort of the vast majority of people don't know what bottled in bond means. And that's okay. Um I think it's really unfortunate that the whiskey industry operates with so much smoke screens that you have to have things that mean something like bottle to bond. I think that's really unfortunate that there's an awful lot of deception. Um, we don't engage in said deception. We've always been very open and honest about who and what we are, but this is the reality of the situation. And those that, you know, whiskey aficionados that know what bottle to bond means appreciate it. They like it. And it's something that they're really searching for. Um, and so we're excited that we get to bring it to them. Ten years in, let's look ten years out. Tell me what few spirits looks like in twenty thirty one. Yeah, man, I just can't wait. Um, and you know, ten more years of continuing to chase after this dream, and ten more years of learning, and ten more years of doing what we do, and ten more years of expressing our art. I mean, that's an exciting concept. A uh, few spirits, we're not going anywhere. Uh, we're going to make the next 10 years. We're going to make the next 20 years. We're going to make the next 30 years. Um, that few brand, that few that few logo on that bottle, that's always been a indicator of quality. It's always going to be an indicator of quality. And we're really excited to be able to do that. You know, For the next 10 years, I just want to keep on doing what we're doing, bringing the best whiskey we can to the market every day creating, innovating, making new things, following the creative muse where it takes us, Um, continuing to grow. Uh, You know, even during COVID, we've continued some pretty aggressive growth. And, you know, in the next 10 years, I anticipate keeping that up, if not even accelerating the growth. Uh, We are the established brands or one of the established brands in craft whiskey. You know, we are a sign of quality. And as you're exploring whiskey, you know, don't sleep on few spirits. Come check us out. Come get it. Come try our stuff. If you tried our stuff a couple of years ago, come back and try us again. Um, that's kind of the message that we're giving is we're here. We're not going away. Let's, uh, let's share a drink together. Looking also to the future, 
You and I both have significantly more gray in our hair than we did 10 years ago. Have you started putting a succession plan in place? Do you think your kids are going to take this on someday? I'm just hoping to hold on until my grandson is 21 and can take over the podcast in a few more <laughs> years. Do you have a succession uh, plan in place? Yeah, I mean, yeah, obviously I'm getting older. Uh, we're not that of, old, but you've got to think about I'm it. I'm getting older, though. I do got a little bit of gray in my hair. You're, uh, you're correct. I was just getting mocked yesterday for the gray stripe right in front by my wife. Uh, and uh, Hey, it looks good. And I'm, I no longer have a forehead. It's a little bit more of a five head or possibly even a six. Uh, but uh, no, I'm, like, I'm really excited for the future. The team we have at FEW is some of the best in the business. Uh, will my kids come and join in? I, I don't know. Um, my, I just, uh, my oldest daughter just went off to college. Uh, so she's, you know, she's just 18 and you know, she'll be 21 in three years. Uh, my youngest daughter is 15 and uh, uh, just had her first uh, getting in trouble with mom and dad for uh, uh, going into the cabinet that she shouldn't have been going into. Um, been there. <laughs> yeah. I think uh, any parent has. Uh she won't be doing that again. Uh, but um, does it make it more popular for your 18 year old when people ask her at school, what do your parents do? And, and she goes, well, my dad runs a distillery. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I think it took him a while to kind of get over the embarrassment because anything dad does is by definition dorky and embarrassing. And uh, there's, you know, they all three of them continue to be really embarrassed and humiliated by me because I am dorky and embarrassing and humiliating been there but uh they are as they get older they're starting to go wait what a sec wait wait wait, what dad is dad does this um my daughter was ripping my youngest was ripping on me a couple weeks ago for um polluting the earth by making whiskey and being a terrible eco person and i just responded that you know we literally were just named the most sustainable distillery on the planet we won the most sustainable distillery on the planet, and I'm the bad guy. Okay, um, that kind of that kind of quieted her down a little bit. Uh, but uh, yeah, that well, and the fact well, that oh, let's see the that work uh, sort of put the roof over your head and the food yeah. on your table <laughs> and uh, all that fun stuff, and paying for college in a few years. Okay, uh, I can go save the earth, but you want to find a way to pay for college, right? <laughs> exactly. And you, you seem to eat every day. Um, but no, I mean, will, will, will my kids come in the business? I, I don't know. I, I don't have a personal ego stake tied up in it. Um, my oldest, probably not. She's really into, uh, she wants to be rich. Um, she's not going to get rich doing what I do. That's for sure. Um, my youngest, maybe. My son, maybe. Um I, I want them to do what they want to do, not what I want to do. And if they want to get involved, then obviously I can, I can kind of clear the way and they're going to have an easier job getting a job in the liquor business than I did. You know, I had to start my own to get a job in the liquor business. Um, will they do it? I don't know. Maybe. But uh, whether they do or not, uh, the team we have at FEW is amazing. You know, we got people like Riley Henderson. I mean, what – what talent Jared Gaither. Holy cow. The talent these people have. Uh, Sydney Jones. Insane. I mean, she just started with us. Uh, uh, Sydney started with us maybe four months ago and she's already just getting ready to really, she's really getting her feet under her now and really just kind of set that base level for how much she can do. And it's, and it's astonishing her future. Uh it's so exciting. And it's across the board, like our rack house team. These guys are amazing. Getting the logistics, getting everything done. Uh, Skylar Rutzlaff over there is just a beast. Uh, you know, Lolo in our front of house, you know, taking care of the customer experience. Uh, amazing stuff. Like this team, and we get, we can do anything. Once again, Fuse 10th anniversary for Grain Bourbon will go on sale at retailers in Illinois this week and at the distillery in Evanston with a recommended retail price of $60 a bottle. Fuse first bottled in bond whiskey will be available starting in October in Illinois, New York, California, Colorado, Texas, and Florida with a recommended retail price of $49.99 a bottle. 
and the annual Four Kings collaboration between Few and the Mississippi River Distilling Company in Iowa, Corsair Artisan Distillery in Tennessee, and Michigan's Journeyman Distillery will go on sale in November, right around Whiskey Fest Chicago time. This year's release is a four-grain blended American whiskey that's finished in rum casks from Martinique. There's no word yet on pricing. That's Whiskey Cast in Depth. It's brought to you by Oban. Every sip of Oban is like a postcard. Oban Single Malt Scotch Whiskey is offering the chance to immerse yourself in Oban and the whiskey-making process through the Oban Abode Experience. Two winners will receive a trip to Scotland to stay in the Oban Abode. It's located just steps from the distillery. And time's running out to enter. To find out more details, visit obenabode.obenwhiskey.com. You'll find complete rules at the website. The Wadham Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit. Let's start off with the whiskey we broke the news on last time around, the new Jack Daniels 10-year-old Tennessee whiskey. Unfortunately, my sample did not arrive until after the last episode dropped, but it was worth the wait. It's bottled at 48.5% ABV. The nose has touches of toasted caramel, charred oak, and roasted nuts, along with hints of vanilla, molasses, and dried fruits. The taste is dry and spicy with cinnamon, black pepper, and chili powder, balanced by hints of toasted caramel, brown sugar, and dried fruits in the background. Adding a few drops of water opens up fruity bites and a hint of chocolate, while not sacrificing the overall intensity. The finish is long, bold, and complex with a nice balance of spices, dried fruits, and oak. I'm scoring the new Jack Daniels 10-year-old Tennessee whiskey a 93. Stranahan's head distiller Owen Martin joined us Friday night on the Happy Hour Live webcast, and I had the chance to taste both of his latest distillery exclusives this week. We'll focus on the new Caribbean rum cask finish single malt. It's bottled at 47% ABV. The nose has notes of grilled pineapple, brown sugar, a hint of orange peel, and touches of honey, vanilla, and toasted oak. The taste is fruity, sweet, and tart with a bite of white pepper spice, grilled pineapple, honey, and brown sugar for a nice balance, while the finish is long and fruity with lingering spices. I'm scoring the Stranahan's Caribbean Rum Cask Single Malt a 92, and you can find my tasting notes for the Stranahan's Bushmills Cask Finish at whiskeycast.com. I'll have more tasting notes in just a minute, but first, this week's tasting notes are brought to you by Sagamore Spirit Rye Whiskey. They're reviving the tradition of Maryland-style rye at their Baltimore farm and waterfront distillery. Their tequila cask-finished rye just received a gold medal in the San Francisco World Spirits Competition. It's rye whiskey finished in extra Añejo tequila barrels, displaying notes of agave and vanilla, dried fig, and honey. In-person tastings are available once again at the distillery in Baltimore, but you'll also find a variety of virtual tours, tastings, and other experiences online at the Sagamore Spirit website, and that includes a free virtual guided tasting for WhiskeyCast listeners. Purchase bottles at your local retailer, and a Sagamore Spirit teammate will guide you through each one. Visit sagamorespirit.com and use the code WhiskeyCast, all one word, to access them. Please drink responsibly. Metallica's Blackened Whiskey has launched a new range of whiskeys, where head distiller Rob Dietrich is collaborating with other distillers, it's called the Masters of Whiskey series, and the first release is a collaboration with Drew Culsveen of Willet Distillery. They took Drew's Willet Rye Whiskey, finished in Madeira wine casks, and put it through Blacken's proprietary Black Noise Sonic Enhancement process, developed by the late Dave Pickerel and the members of Metallica. 
The whiskey is bottled at 54.8% ABV, and the nose has notes of dry rub barbecue spices, apricots, peaches, nutty touches of pecans and almonds, and a hint of toasted oak. The taste has intense spices along with a peach nectar thickness for a nice mouthfeel, along with touches of toasted oak and chocolate-covered nuts. The finish is long, dry, and spicy, with touches of dark chocolate and black cherries. I'm scoring the Black and X Willet Rye Masters of Whiskey series release a 93. And finally, let's look at Heaven Hill's Fall 2021 release of Old Fitzgerald Bottled in Bond. This release is an 11-year-old weeded bourbon distilled in the spring season of 2020. Of course, it is bottled at 50% ABV. The nose has notes of toasted caramel, cocoa, honey, vanilla, charred oak, and hints of black pepper and allspice. The taste has fruity touches of red apples and peaches, balanced by black pepper, hints of allspice and cinnamon, honey, and a hint of dark chocolate. The finish is long and fruity with a nice touch of spice. I'm scoring the Old Fitzgerald Bottled in Bond Fall 2021 release a 92. The Whatam Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit. I've added these tasting notes to our searchable list of more than 3,200 different whiskeys from all over the world. Check it out this week at whiskeycast.com. It's been 175 years and Dewar's continues to stay curious. We're proud to announce the newest addition to the innovative Dewar's 8-year cast finish series of Scotch whiskey, Dewar's Japanese Smooth. Brought to life by our award-winning master blender, Stephanie McLeod, Japanese Smooth is a perfectly balanced 8-year-old Scotch whiskey that puts a pioneering and innovative focus on our aging process. After eight years in Scotland, we blend, age again, then finish this whiskey in cast made from 200-year-old Mizunara oak trees. Rare? Sure, but worth it. The Mizunara oak perfectly complements the tasting notes with Dewar's Scotch whiskey. Japanese Smooth is loaded with Dewar's signature honey and floral notes, with the Japanese Mizunara oak adding exotic sweet and spicy flavors. Curious? Try this one in a perfect Japanese highball or on the rocks. Let's open up the inbox now for your voice. I mentioned our breaking the story on the release of the new Jack Daniels 10-year-old last week. We got this comment from Mark Page in Wales at M. Page Map on Twitter. Not happy being a squire as well. Very annoyed U.S. only on this. Got the rest of the family in the cabinet, along with several sad emojis. Now, Mark referred to being a squire. That's the Tennessee Squires, the official Jack Daniels fan club of sorts. Membership is by nomination only, and only for the most dedicated Jack Daniels lovers. And as for not being able to get a bottle of this one in Wales, as we reported last time, the 10-year-old is only available in the U.S. this year as a limited edition. They don't have a lot of casks that old to work with yet, and while I am not speaking for the distillery, it wouldn't surprise me, though, if distribution does expand in the coming years, as they have more older whiskey available. Now our good friend Scott Harris, who founded Catoctin Creek with his wife Becky a decade or so ago, tweeted this rant over the weekend. At the Louisville Airport, where they have a prominent distillery store, and I just love arguing with some white guy who thinks he knows more about whiskey than everybody else in the room. Well, I couldn't resist tweeting this back. Just wait until you see the look on his face when you tell him your wife knows even more about whiskey than you do. Now, I say that only because Becky is the distiller at Catoctin Creek and a trained chemical engineer, while Scott runs the rest of the operation, but it led to a few more comments like these. From at Ty the Bourbon Guy, One of my favorite memories was being at a bar with my wife. 
I ordered a cocktail. She ordered a cask-strength bourbon neat. The bartender was very confused. And from longtime listener Sue Williams at Real Sue Williams on Twitter, We've been there so many times. I need my husband to take a picture of my face the next time. Or when I order and they say, quote, That's a lot of whiskey for a little lady. Complete with eyes rolling emoji. Gang, I can't wait for the day when we're not judged by others for what we drink or how we drink it. At Kentucky Spirits called me out on Twitter the other day for the way I referred to time zones when we're talking about the Happy Hour live webcast, specifically when I referred to it as starting at 5 p.m. New York time. Just letting you know how that sounds in Kentucky. I think people have gotten used to time zones by now, and it actually removes one operation by converting New York time to Eastern Daylight Time, or EDT. We are both really in GMT-5, adjusted for Daylight Saving Time. Just think it's outdated, and people should be smart enough to know what time zone they're in without using a particular large city for reference. And I did combine a couple of his tweets there. So... Actually, and yes, I'm going to time-splain here. There's a really good reason why I use New York City time. Most smartphones and computers don't list the time zones, but their apps list cities instead. So if I'm trying to find out what time it is in, say, Tokyo, I don't know what time zone Tokyo is in, but I know that if I type Tokyo into my World Clock app, It'll take care of that for me and give me the correct time. I had to remind him also that Kentucky is split between the eastern time zone and the central time zone. The western half of the state is an hour behind Louisville time. Look, I grew up in Indiana. We never changed the clocks during the summer when I was growing up, because back then almost all of the state never observed daylight saving time. So this stuff sort of becomes ingrained after a while. Part of the year you're on New York time, part of it you're on Chicago time. If you have something you'd like to share with whiskey lovers around the world, you can always find us on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook at WhiskeyCast. The email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. Let's close out the show now with Behind the Label, our look at the history, science, and all those other things that make whiskey unique. It's brought to you by Writer's Tears. David Levine at Whiskey Ring on Twitter and host of the Whiskey Ring podcast asked this question the other day. Why do some Scotch and Irish brands use the, as in the McAllen, the Dalmore, the whatever? whereas some do not. Is it to do with the states, with some esoteric naming convention? Cheers and thanks. David, I hate to say it, but you're overthinking it just a bit. As with a lot of things in life, lawyers and marketing folks get a lot of the blame. It all goes back to the late 1800s in Scotland, when the Glenlivet had established its reputation for its whiskey, and other distilleries in the Speyside area were trying to pass their whiskies off as Glenlivets. John Gordon Smith, who inherited the Glenlivet distillery in 1871 from his father, George Smith, decided to go after the imposters in court. He won a verdict that protected his right to, quote, the Glenlivet, but allowed other distillers to add the word Glenlivet to their names with a hyphen, such as Glenfarkless hyphen Glenlivet. Now that practice has pretty much gone by the wayside, but you may see older bottlings and even a few casks with hyphenated names, even some labeled McAllen Glenlivet. You see, the Glenlivet name is derived from Gaelic for the Valley of the River Livet, which flows into the Spey River. It's also the name of the parish of Glenlivet, 
and it is really hard to claim a trademark for a specific geographic place, such as a town or a parish. So even the Smith family wound up calling its whiskeys the Glenlivet. That's why distilleries that are named after towns or other places will occasionally add the to their whiskey branding. It's also done by distilleries to differentiate their official releases from independent bottlings, since bottlers will often name the distillery where their whiskey was made on the label. For instance, McAllen Distillery's official bottlings will always be labeled the McAllen, while independent bottlings may be labeled, quote, distilled at McAllen Distillery. And yes, it's also done for marketing reasons to add either a bit of exclusivity or reflect changes in ownership. For instance, the ownership group led by Silvio Benz of Lalique Crystal fame acquired Glen Turret Distillery from Edrington a couple of years ago, and when the distillery unveiled its new whiskey range last year, it was branded as the Glen Turret, just to reflect a new future for the distillery. David, thanks for asking the question. I hope that answers it. And if you have something you'd like us to look at on an upcoming episode, just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us. Behind the Label is brought to you by Writer's Tears. Writer's Tears Copper Pot. The tears of Ireland's great writers bursting with flavor, humor, and angst. Bottled for you to taste. No writers were harmed in the making of this premium Irish whiskey. Writer's Tears Copper Pot. That's all for this edition of Whiskey Cast. You'll find links for the stories in this episode in our show notes at whiskeycast.com, along with the latest whiskey news, the calendar of events, my tasting notes, the whiskey photo of the week, cocktail recipes, and a complete archive of all of our past episodes all the way back to 2005. Get in touch with us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at WhiskeyCast. The email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. Ever go out drinking with a peacock? <laughs> Always the same. Few too many, tail feathers come out, drinks get knocked over, bartender's not happy, night's over before it started. All I'm saying is, don't be the peacock in your group. Proud sponsor of WhiskeyCast, Redbreast. Pass it on. Just like the end of this WhiskeyCast episode, Dewar's Scotch Whiskey always makes for a smooth finish. Like our newly released Dewar's Japanese Smooth, aged for eight years in Scotland, blended then aged again before being finished for up to six months in Mizunar oak casts made from 200-year-old Japanese water oak trees. These unique casts layer distinct dry and spicy flavors to the whiskey, with aromas reminiscent of sandalwood and incense. Keep an eye out for a bottle of Dewar's Japanese Smooth at a store near you. Whiskey Cast is a production of Cast Strength Media, copyright 2021, and comes to you from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening, and please stay safe.